Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining me and Wild Bear um, for our Common Birds of the Wider Nederland Region um, webinar today. Thanks. This we had such a great turnout and demand for day a midday presentation. I gave this um, earlier in March, so I'm really excited to be able to give the presentation again with some slight tweaks and um, maybe some of you had joined in before and if you hadn't, well, welcome today. Um, I'm going to go ahead and introduce myself as everyone's putting their name, where they're tuning in from, and what type of bird they would like to be if they were a bird in the chat. My name is Michelle Witte. I'm the Nature Education Director for Wild Bear Nature Center. Um, Wild Bear Nature Center is in Nederland, Colorado, so if you haven't made it up to visit the center, I strongly encourage you to do so. We're in a really awesome time of evolution and change. We're growing a lot and there's new exhibits almost every month. So come on, check it out. We're also be hosting big year events, which is, this one is one of them, um, monthly throughout the rest of the year. So we'll go into what our big year is and all that sort of great stuff. So I love working for Wild Bear. I get to do all sorts of fun, different things. So we have programs for families, children, adults, um, and this year we're focusing on birds. So thanks for coming in and tuning in today. Um, I guess I'm asking all of you what type of bird you would want to be. Maybe I should answer that question too. Um, if I were a bird, I usually say I'd be an owl or an osprey. I think today I'd feel like an osprey. Raptors are really incredible. Those birds of prey and ospreys, 99% of their diet is fish. So they have really incredible adaptations to be able to fish water, fish in the water and catch primarily like they have like basically Velcro talons to grab the gills of fish and all sorts of stuff. So they're definitely some of my favorites. Alrighty, so I'm gonna go ahead and jump right into my presentation because an hour is never enough time to talk about birds, but I'm going to do my best. Um, if you have questions, please put them in the chat. I'll be checking with my teammates to answer those as we go along. And I'm also going to do my best to save some time at the end of the presentation to answer those questions or take your feedback. So thanks for joining us. All right, here we go. So today we're gonna to go over some of the most common popular birds um, that live in the Nederland Legion. So they're going to, we're going to some of the birds that are commonly seen in Clear Creek, Jefferson, and kind of the whole region that we are using for our geographic border for our big year. So welcome. And then, oops, here we go. Cool. So during today's presentation, I'll be introducing some tips and tricks on how to ID birds in general and how to like up your birding skills throughout, especially right now, my migration season is about to start. It's a really great time to see tons of different birds. So having little tips and tricks like field marks, studying a worksheet like this is a really good thing to do maybe when you're at home the night before you're planning on going out birding the next day is um, kind of reviewing all the different parts of a bird because birders will use a lot of this terminology in field guides and otherwise and it will really help you along your way with identifying different birds based on where colors and patterns and size and shape and things like that are on their different field marks. So if I bring up some of these during my presentation, this will be a great thing to um, refer to later. All right, so like I was saying, um, field marks often refer to different colors or patterns that we see within the bird's plumage or its feather patterns. So the first four things I guess I should really say five things I'm always looking for when I'm observing a bird or really anything out in nature is its size. Is it robin size? And you can always compare it to other types of birds with size, like is it hawk size or sparrow size? Or you can compare it to like, it's about the size of my water bottle, um, other familiar objects. So size and then shape. Is it a long skinny bird with big long, widespread feathers that are like fingers or are they tight? Um, those sorts of things. So shape really helps. And then color can be super important between telling different species or even between telling male and female in the same species because their plumage can be different and even be different throughout the year. So um, location matters, time of year matters, especially for the migratory birds. 
Um, and then behavior. So it's not all about their physical characteristics. It's also about what is that bird doing and where are they doing it and when. So is it foraging on the ground for seeds or is it pecking at the wood and the little crevices in the bark? That can tell you a lot about different birds, their species, and even if you're looking at the same bird in the right habitat. So I have this example from All About Birds, which is a great resource that um, I use a lot to learn my birds and help teach other people about birds. It's on the Cornell Lab of Ornithology website. Um, so black cap chickadee, which is um, around here, not quite in as abundant numbers as our um, mountain chickadee, which we're also going to talk about in a little bit, but I just use them as an example. So you can kind of size and shape tiny bird, large head relative to its body size, and it's kind of nice and round. Um, so those types of words using narrow, um, short versus long, all those sorts of descriptors can really help you along your way. And it breaks it down into color, the behavior, as well as habitat. So where you're going to find it versus another type of bird. All right. So I thought it'd be a good idea just to download you on a little bit of exactly how many species of birds are um, so far recorded in the great state of Colorado, this beautiful centennial state. Um, we have over 500 birds. So far, 513 was the most recent estimate I was able to find of recorded species in this state, which is really high for a landlocked state. Many of the coastal states you'll find a lot more just because of the ocean and what that brings. But because we're in the middle of the country, so many migrators come east, west, north, south. And so even if they're not here year round, we're on their way up towards Canada or down towards Mexico or over to the west coast or east coast. So we get a lot of those just flying over and kind of stopping by on their pathway. Plus, Colorado has so many different diverse habitats from low area plains to high mountain peaks with rivers and streams and all sorts of different things. So it just allows a lot of diverse habitats that um, kind of allow birds to find the resources they need almost any time of year. Um, and then within that Boulder County, since we're kind of smack down in the middle of the state and we have lower elevations and higher with a bunch of different lakes and reservoirs and rivers and streams, we have a record of 411 species. So in this region alone, almost all the birds that can be seen in the whole state of Colorado, you can almost find all of them. And then over 200 of those birds stay in Colorado year round. So even in the dead of winter, you have the possibility of seeing a lot of different birds who have adapted to our harsh winters in the Rocky Mountains. So this is our mountain chickadee. It's one of our most common and it is a year round resident. Real cute little friend here. Um, when I'm out with the kids, it's one of the most common birds we see and it's a really easy first bird for a lot of us to learn. You'll notice it kind of has that white eyebrow and white under eye and a short little bill. They eat mostly mites and other insects outside of the bark, especially in the winter, but they also eat seeds and other little things. So in the winter, they like to kind of roost or rest in cavities or the holes of woodpeckers and other birds. And a lot of times they even do it with other chickadees or even in what we call a mixed flock with nuthatches or other smaller songbirds to um, gain some warmth. So that's one of their adaptations to make it through the winter here. Um, and they also have a couple of different really cute calls. Some are reserved for only mating season. And that is where they get the name the cheeseburger bird, at least me and some of my circles, that's what we call them. Their three little note call for mating is cheeseburger. And no, he doesn't want a cheeseburger. He's looking for a girlfriend. So I actually have been starting to hear the cheeseburger a little bit more the past couple of weeks since, you know, spring has started and the snow is starting to melt and the birds are starting to be like, oh, it's time to have a family. Where they got their namesake, however, is also from one of their calls, but their alarm call. So their call of alert, if there's a predator in the area, if a male is competing for territory or a female, or sometimes just because they feel like it. They also make a lot of different ch -ch 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 little chit chats where they're just talking to each other, feeling really happy or excited, or even sometimes annoyed, and they make those little sounds. So I actually have a clip of some of those sounds for us all to hear today. And if you have any problems hearing anything, just let us know in the chat and we'll do our best to troubleshoot that.
can hear that cheeseburger. And then some cute other little chit chats in there. So you're going to be hearing that more and more. So really, this is one of the um, most common and easy calls to learn. So it'd be a good starter practice when you're walking around almost any habitat around Nederland and the higher elevations, you're going to find mountain chickadees. All righty. Ooh, this is another fun one. I love this bird. In fact, I was out for work. We're making these fun educational videos. And on Friday, there was a pygmy nuthatch interrupting me. I was trying to teach about trees and it was knocking in the tree and going, doo -doo 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 -doo. so they're really fun. They're really cute. Um, they have a short little stubby tail that kind of bounces up and down. Nuthatches um, in general really pick out bugs out of the bark. So you're always going to find them on the trunks and on the bark of the tree, moving up and down, kind of hopping around. They're pretty quick, little fun little birds. And they even sometimes you can confuse them with a the woodpecker because they do peck into the trees. It's just usually not quite as loud or as intense as they're such a small little bird. We have a couple other species of nuthatches that are fairly common in um, the area as well, like the white-breasted nuthatch and so on. They're just a little bigger. The pygmy is real short. Um, and they kind of have that brownish head with a grayish bluish body and that white breast really stands out. Um, so yeah, you can also find them on the ground foraging for your seeds or insects, but most of the time they'll be on the bark of the tree. Like I said, a lot of our coniferous pine trees. All right, and then they have a short, cute little call that I'll play for you now. All righty, here we go. I think it's in the front part. Okay, there. Okay, this is Michelle's favorite bird. Well, one of the my favorite birds. I love this bird mostly because of its call, which we'll get to in just a minute. But I also really like its behavior. And I think its plumage is really cool. Um, and look at that beak, that nice curved beak. Maybe in the chat you can put, what does that longer curved beak for such a small bird maybe help it with? Now beaks are always a clue um, to what the bird eats. You know, raptors with their strong, really hooked beak for tearing apart flesh, beaks sense their predators. Woodpeckers with their long, strong beaks to peck into wood and get bugs. So other and short, small bill of that chickadee. So all these bills and beaks, um, kind of interchangeable depending, um, can really grab at the different food source that that bird particularly eats. So with that longer curved bill, the small little brown creeper and where it's hanging out, it has similar behavior to some nut hutches where it will start usually at the bottom of the tree and creep, kind of where it got its name, up and sometimes it will even kind of spiral as it does so, does so foraging for insects inside the cracks of the bark. So that little hooked curved beak really helps them get into those crevices and find their yummy tasty treat. Layers are mostly brown and speckled, so they are pretty hard to visually find because they're so well camouflaged into that bark. Pretty smart of that. But usually how I know there's a creeper in the area is by their call which to me sounds like trees, trees, beautiful trees, 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 beautiful trees. And it is always a reminder when I hear a brown creeper to appreciate how amazing all the trees around me are. And then also like, you know, be a creeper myself trying to find the bird. All right, let's listen to that. Those trees, trees, beautiful trees. So I like to come up with little words that replace the notes in the song because that really helps at least with how my brain works and a lot of humans because if you have a little rhyme or something it can help you remember that and so when you hear it again instead of just hearing these random notes you're hearing trees trees beautiful trees or cheeseburger or something else and of course they make little other sounds too that you probably heard a little bit mm -hmm. they're really cute and they're really fun and fairly I've been hearing um, them a few times over by Mud Lake. I've heard them a bunch lately. So they are starting to kind of start singing and start creeping again because bugs are going to be back too. It's springtime. It's the best. 
Okay. So a very common waterfowl across most of North America is the Canada goose. And I'm going to give you a fun fact. They are not Canadian geese. They are Canada geese. Um, so a lot of times in ornithology and in fact in just science, um, the scientist that discovered a species has the honor of naming the species or we name it after them. So the ornithologist that um, kind of named and discovered and first studied Canada geese was Joseph Canada. So it was the last name of the person that named them and described them. And so actually calling them Canadian geese is a misnomer. So fun fact there, a lot of people think, oh, they're from Canada, which yes, they spent a lot of time in Canada, um, but it's actually after that. So fun fact for you, you can smell, sound like a smarty next time someone calls them Canadian geese. Um, so they're also a very famous and popular migrator and they always need to be around water since they're eating aquatic plants and insects and stuff usually at the bottom of those ponds. And like they have, if you can notice and it might be a little hard to see, but they have seeds, those little slits on the sides of their bill and mallards and a lot of dabbling ducks, aquatic waterfowl will have those as well for eating aquatic plants. So they dabble, meaning their rump, their rear end will be up out of the water with their head under the water eating the plants. And those sieves help for when they exit, the plants the only thing in their mouth. And so they're not dealing with a bunch of water and plants at the same time. I don't know about you, I like to have like my food and then a drink of water later. So it's kind of nature's way of separating the two and giving them that little advantage. They're also mostly waterproof and really buoyant. In fact, most birds are because their bones are so incredibly light, but waterfowl have a little extra stuff inside them to make them a little extra buoyant. They're really great flyers too. They migrate thousands of miles every year. And so they're the classic V shape which birds who migrate together, that strength in numbers, the V-shape helps them be more aerodynamic. So um, scientists and aerospace engineers have studied birds and especially Canada geese to design airplanes and understand the physics of flight better. So that's a pretty cool thing. And then I think a lot of us already know what these guys sound like, but let's get ready for it. <laughs> This is a fun bird to talk about. This is our brown headed cow bird. And this is a male photoed here. Um, so you can tell that he has a little bit of an iridescent body with a darker brown head. And then that kind of bigger beak, they're seed eaters and insect eaters. So that bigger beak, kind of like a lot of our gross beaks, like evening gross beak or black field gross beak, they have those big beaks to crack seeds open. It works like a nutcracker. It's really awesome. So let's listen to them. They often get perched on top of a tree and they also forage on the ground quite often. So that high pitch one note. Kind of like, <laughs> so here he is our, my second slide of a female. So you can tell she's a lot more kind of um, toned down and the difference of her head to her body isn't really noticeable because it's all that little bit lighter brown. Of course, females tend to be less vibrant in color um because they don't they're the ones that want to be impressed by the males the males are the ones trying to do the impressing plus females typically are the ones sitting on the nest um protecting the eggs so they were these bright colors that be a lot more obvious for predators so they want to kind of blend in and camouflage a lot more than the males that's their priority all right i hear that i have a question in the chat so let me Pull that up before I share a little bit more. Um, give me one second, friends. Let me make sure. Huh. Aaron, can you just tell me what that question is? Because mine is in. Isn't is that a picture of a cackling goose? The neck is very short, so it's below the nipples. Oh. 
Um, I got this right off of All About Birds. So it should be a Canada goose, but I will do some more research and get back to you because I'm not above making that sort of mistake. Uh, anyway, okay. So our brown-headed cowbird, the female, you guys might be wondering, what is this nest? And it looks like a robin's nest with another random egg because that's exactly what it is. So these brown-headed cowbirds um, are parasitic. So what they do in terms of their nesting, they don't actually build their own nest. What the mother will do is find another bird like a robin, usually a smaller um, bird, and lay her egg in there, sometimes more than one egg, but usually one at a time. And that way the robin mother will actually be the one sitting on those eggs, taking care of her three eggs and the one cowbird egg. And then when the cowbird egg hatches with all the rest of the fledglings of the robins, they will be fed by the robin mom. And the cowbird is usually bigger and more aggressive and gets more food and outcompetes all of that other species where the cowbird mom kind of just dropped her egg. So it's kind of a really interesting strategy. It's not so beneficial for the robin, obviously, but parasites are clever. We're dealing with one on a massive level as, as the coronavirus. Um, so even though parasites are not fun for the host, the parasite themselves are really smart. And this is an example of it. We often don't think of a parasite in the form of a bird or something, but this is a form of parasitism. It's pretty interesting. All righty. So this is another really fun bird that often people are like, whoa, that looks like it belongs in the tropics. And half the year, it does. This is the Western tanager, and the one photoed here is the male. They have that bright, vibrant, reddish, orange head and yellow body. Um, and then the females don't really have the orange on their head, and the yellow is a little more drab. Um, these birds spend their breeding season and mating season here in the Western Rockies and actually most of Western pine forests and up into Oregon, Washington, Canada, Western coast, those sorts of places. They really like to hang on the top of pine trees, higher up in the canopy and jump around. They're insect eaters and berry eaters with some seeds in there too. And that's actually one of my favorite facts about the male is that his red head of course comes from genetics like with most um, species of birds but also a little bit from the pigment of carotenoid pigments inside berries or the blood of insects makes it a more vibrant red and they're one of the species of birds where the male will spend time with the female raising the young building the nest and so that's more of a signal to the female that he is a good provider, essentially, be able to find food and those sorts of things. Um, they are also, this is a good bird. So if you're going to bird by ear, I always kind of give the advice of starting with a simple common bird, because a lot of birds have similar calls, but one might be a little higher pitch or faster or lower, um, just like a slight change. But if you get something like the robin down and then compare it to something like the Western tanager, you can really kind of notice the differences and start building from there. So the Western tanager has a call much like the robin, but a little faster and high pitch. So let's listen to that now. This is a cliff swallow. And we have many different species of swallow that live in the Netherlands and wider region that are fairly common and they're often hang out together. Um, they really like to be near water because they're insect eaters, but they can kind of survive in other locations as long as there's enough bugs and different things for them to eat. They make cup nests on the sides of cliffs or on the side of our nature center. Often they've adapted really well to um, developed areas like bridges and different places like that. Basically what they need is a hard surface with kind of an overhang to build their colony because they 
can grow into colonies of hundreds where they all kind of nest together and get little mud mud in their beaks and bring them and spit them out and build these really awesome they look like little adobe um, homes onto the wall so we even have those um, at the nature center it's kind of an added exhibit outside the nature center if you want to come check them out but they also like to hang out by the water, by the reservoirs and hunt with other swallows like the violet green or the barn swallow. Cliff swallow can really be identified by what a lot of ornithologists and birders call the headlamp. So you can kind of see that white dot on the top of its head and then it's got kind of a rufous under neck and nape. And then that rufous goes into the breast and then gets more white as it goes down into the belly. And then with kind of a grayish black iridescent um, body. So they do nest in um, colonies, like I said, they're pretty social and they're small little ones. They zip, zip, zip. They have a fork tail. Um, that's kind of an identifier of all swallows. Yes. I believe, yes, swallows are also at the post office. So a lot of times when you see those mud nests that go on buildings, um, they also nest on my apartment building. So a lot of times those mud nests that get on, um, a lot of times it will be cliff swallows or barn swallows are pretty common in human developed areas doing that too. And sometimes violet green, they all kind of have that same nest um, structure. Great question. All right, let's listen to their beautiful little call. Very social. <laughs> awesome. And another good idea you can't really ID is on the rump. It's kind of like an orange little spot. So sometimes when they're flying in, they dip and you can't really see their um, headlamp or their rufus, then you can see kind of on their rump and that can help you too. All right, ooh, this is one of my favorites. It's also John Muir's favorite bird. He called it the water oozel. Um, the American Dipper, which actually um, I had some folks come into the nature center the other day and then I went back to try to find it and I couldn't. But um, there's an American Dipper that's been hanging out um, on Boulder Creek by the reservoir. So that could be a good place for some of us to go look in the next couple of weeks if you want. And then they will, in general, like to hang out by creeks and streams and stuff because their behavior is to dip under and with that semi-long little beak is grab little insects and other small mollusks and things off of the rocks in the water. So they have a lot of different adaptations to make them really well suited for life in cold alpine streams. So they kind of have, kind of like how a beaver does or other birds where it can just roll off. In fact, the structure of a feather isn't only built to help birds fly and keep air trapped in, but it's also built like Velcro or how the feathers kind of stick together where these barbs and barbules click together and not only help wind stay in so they can fly and create um, thrust and create lift, but also waterproofing. So um, little drips of water will just roll off so they can stay dry and warm for flight and just for body regulation. So that's a really cool behavior and probably what the dipper is most famous for. And that little tiny little tail is just super cute when it's dipping up and down. I actually have a video clip I'll show you in a second. But first I would love to share with you their call. That's real quiet, especially with the screen in the background. But it's real quick. It's faster and faster. So I tend to bird for these via location and behavior more than by sound, just because for me and for a lot of birders I've gone out with, that's a little easier to find than say, listening for a robin or a woodpecker drumming. Um, so this bird is in the passerine family. So they're rated as sparrows and swallow, um, finches and all those great big group of birds. They have a little, when they close their eyes, it turns white. And because if you didn't notice, a lot of times scientists are thinking that's for communication between partners or other birds because the water is often um, so loud that they can't even hear each other. Um, so here's a fun little video of a dipper in action.
And bobbing up and down, getting the yum yums under the water. You can tell it's like still frosty wherever this little bird is. Very cool. All righty. Whoops. Cool. And then, of course, um, I should have said this earlier, but if friends on the chat have more facts that they want to share or ID tips, um, I can't get into all of it because, you know, there's so much with such a little time. So everyone is invited to share their knowledge in the chat at, um, or even network with one another to go birding. Of course, I encourage being safe right now during the pandemic, but, you know, outdoors is great. I have a question. Ooh. So um, dippers occasionally will submerge their whole body, but they're not necessarily like a diver or anything like that um, with ducks and other things. But depending on the stream, the flow, and where the bug is, they can swim, they will dip, but for the most part, you're gonna see them in the shallows just dipping their body up and down, like we saw in the video. Alrighty, the Calliope hummingbird. In fact, a lot of different hummingbirds are about to return, and wild bear, especially for the um, broad tail hummingbird and roof and all those, but any hummingbird, we're kind of having a contest right now, so I encourage you guys all to get on our Facebook, and we're doing a prediction contest of when the first hummingbirds are going to be migrating back into the area, um, and it's kind of a fun study as well, um, because right now, with climate change and so many other variables, we're seeing migrations happening sooner. We're seeing um, all sorts of different things changing with breeding and those sorts of things. So it's kind of a citizen science project too, even though it's a fun, friendly competition. It's a nice way for us to kind of start noticing like last year, our predictions coming in and the actual sightings, is it gonna be sooner or later? And we can kind of think of how is that tied into the greater picture of what's happening in our state and in our world. Um, so the Calliope hummingbird, hummingbirds in general are incredible, real small little powerful birds that can migrate thousands of miles. Um, some of the species can, and they're also pollinators. So um, most of us probably know how incredibly important pollinators are to the planet and our food source and plants. So them and their flower counterparts have evolved together to have characteristics that are best suited for one another. So hummingbirds typically really like red flowers that kind of are tubular shaped like many of our penstemons, um, columbines, and things like that. So they have that long beak that kind of works like a straw, but they also have a really long tongue that can go down into the flower to lick up that nectar for their food. Many hummingbirds also eat tiny little insects, which so if some hummingbirds get here a little early before all the blooms because the snow is still melting, they're gonna be okay. They're gonna be able to feed on little insects and do just fine. Um, so this is the male calliope hummingbird you can see with such that beautiful iridescent throat. It's like a reddish um, rufous-y color with a green iridescent body and white breast. And then, yes. So depending on the species, um, they can get to really low elevations because a lot of them will live on the coast. It will really just depend on if it's on their migratory path or if they have the right type of flower and those sorts of things. So my guess is that they do come through Longmont but don't stay very long um, just because they're on their way to some, somewhere else. Yeah, so with some, a lot of our migratory birds, um, it's a really short window of when you can see them. So it, it can trick us if we're not like really in tune with everything, but like we never see these birds, but they say they were possible here. A lot of times, like you might only see them for a week or a two week window because that's their quick time when they're heading south or heading north um, or back up to the mountains or those sorts of things. Um, so great question. Um, hummingbirds are also the only bird that can flat their wings in a figure eight pattern. So most birds just do the up and down and use all of that to turn. But because hummingbirds need to hover while they're pollinating or drinking their nectar from a flower, they gotta be able to stay like a helicopter. 
And so they can do a figure eight so they can hover, they can go backwards, they can go diagonal, and that makes them really special. And when they're doing that, their wings, depending on the species, are beating at a rate of 80 to 180 times per second. And that's just mind blowing to me. I don't even understand how that's possible, but that's how fast they're going. Um, and in fact, a lot of times they do use their vocalization, vocalizations to attract a mate, but also hummingbirds do like different motions in the air. It's like a little dance essentially. And that's also something they do to impress the females. And you can, if you really get into it and you have real good eyesight, you can actually ID hummingbirds based on the pattern they're making in the sky. So let's listen to the call of the calliope. Some of it will be the like bzz, other wings, but some of it is also just their kind of very interesting call. It almost sounds like an electrical wire or something. <laughs> And the calliope will, um, compared to some hummingbirds, some hummingbirds also do this, um, but they will convert closer to the ground. Um, and yeah, and then the female, you can see here, has the iridescent green, but a little more of a peachy on their breast and on their belly, and then just a little bit of kind of speckles going vertically um, down their neck right there, and don't have that pink, beautiful, like, um, the males do. They also have a relatively shorter beak compared to some other hummingbirds. In fact, the calliope is pretty small compared to some of our other hummingbirds that are found in the region. But super cute and I can't wait for them to start coming. Um, and springtime and migratory time is a great time to have your hummingbird feeders out as well as other feeders. But once summer truly hits, um, probably around mid-May or so, I would take those back down and put them inside because there's plenty, especially where we live, plenty of resources out there in the wild for the birds to survive on. But sometimes during migratory seasons, that's the time we put out our feeders because that just gives them a little extra boost. Or even um, how you garden can matter and what you plant in your yard. In fact, we're gonna be, I'll talk about it later, but we're gonna be hosting, co-hosting a webinar um, with some master gardeners about attracting birds to your yard using native gardening and other techniques. So I like to mention that with our um, hummingbirds, but it works for other birds of having native plants that attract the birds to your yard, but you're not really interrupting the natural flow of things. And then you're also not getting squirrels and bears and all that stuff that we also have around here, um, climbing on your trees and getting your feeders and those sorts of things. That can be fun, but not necessarily great for those mammals. Alrighty. Uh, so I had to mention a warbler. This is our mini friend who will also be migrating back to the area. Most warblers head to Southern Mexico and Central America for the winter. They are insect eaters that live in riparian zones. So by aspens and cottonwoods and those things always need to be by some type of water where all the bugs are. And they also nest in those willows and in the aspens and stuff. And that's kind of their favorite habitat. Um, warblers, their, their name comes from their calls. They just warble, warble on and on, and their calls more than most other birds remind me of springtime, and they're really beautiful. The yellow warbler is slightly smaller than, say, the Audubon's or yellow rumped warbler and some of our other warblers, and it's almost entirely yellow. It has a little bit of black striping on its wings, and then the male has those rufous stripes on its breast right here. You can see as this male is belting out in those willows here. So let's listen to their beautiful call. one's a little quieter but it's still very beautiful you're going to start hearing that more and more um this type of year in fact the more i give this presentation the more i'm like oh my gosh it's spring the birds are coming back i'm so excited all righty <clears throat> okay so they're about the size of the american goldfinch um if you know that bird and then the bright yellow even though they're bright yellow they can still be pretty hard to um, spot because they're really kind of inside the trees and they hop around a lot but that sound really can guide you. And also habitat is such a huge clue. 
All right. So corvids, which are themes like ravens and stellar jays and the crow and all those sorts of themes. Um, we have both in the area. In fact, both of these birds are very smart and very well adapted to human developed areas and live in so many places across the world in North America. So um, in the chat, I would love for our friends to guess which one of these is a raven and which one is a crow. So this one on the left here, maybe in the chat, put your guesses if you think it's a raven or if you think it is a crow. Do we have any results yet, Erin? Yes, we do. We have several crows on right, several ravens on left. That's a good pattern. Yeah, so on the left here is our raven, and then on the right is the crow. So um, I'm guessing some of you might already know some of the characteristic and differences, at least physically, um, between our crows and ravens. So you'll notice the bill size is one big difference size and shape versus the raven and crow. The ravens is a little bigger and has a kind of even a little overbite. And then also looks like it has little hairs, which are just different um, kind of formation of feathers that go onto the bill. And that's also the crow has a really nice slicked back hair, really took a lot of time while the crow is just kind of like got party vibes going on. Um, so, and it's just bigger. The raven is a bigger bird in general. Um, both of these birds are incredibly smart. In fact, corvids are one of the smartest groups of animals, let alone birds. They're very social. Um, and they also are very talkative and have a lot of different vocalizations. Uh, raven has over 200 different vocalizations that it can do. And a crow has somewhere around like 100 different vocalizations that they can do. Most corvids can even mimic other animals. So they can mimic themes like insects, like cicadas, or other birds, especially predatory birds, like hawks, or they even often will imitate the Douglas squirrel or the chicory, that t -t 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 sound, um, along with their own cloaks and other crazy sounds that these birds will make. Um, so let's listen to our raven first. Ah, there we go. Pretty wild. <laughs> so I'm sure I know I've heard all these sounds out in the dumpster or by the lake or outside my window in the morning. I'm like, what are they up to? Um, and ravens and all corvids are scavengers. Oops. There we go. <laughs> um, so they will eat pretty much anything they can find. They're omnivores, but they're opportunistic omnivores, meaning they also eat trash. They're kind of also part of the cycle of decomposition. So they're going to eat the carrion of a leftover carcass that a mountain lion left behind. So they're really kind of a link in that part of the food web and in the cycle of life. Um, and that's really smart of them because animals that have figured out how to eat anything they have figured out how to survive and therefore they tend to also have all these other characteristics that are signs of intelligence like these vocalizations socialization well adapted for human um, developed areas and things like that all right and mr crow over here So both of these birds are social, like I said, but crows are more social. They're usually hanging out in at least a group of three, if not more. Sometimes hundreds of them can be belong to a murder. We call a group of crows a murder, which is such a kind of ominous name. Um, and then a group of ravens can be known as an unkindness or a conspiracy. So um, researching names of groups of different animals is one of my favorite things to do. And those two, it's like, okay, Edgar Allan Poe, I get why you're writing poems about these animals and some Native American um, 
myths and different things kind of go into that play on of these mysterious kind of really intelligent but interesting animals and birds. All right, let's look through some other characteristics that help us ID these birds. Um, so also shape, like I said, and size is huge. So size in general, the raven is gonna be bigger. So the one on the left here is the raven in flight and it's wing pattern and shape. So you'll see it's kind of outer feathers look like a hand that's really wide open with the thumb further down where the crows, they're all kind of still together and even a little more like almost curved wings where the raven almost looks like more of a T. You also notice the shape of the tail. This is probably, especially in flight, sometimes the size, depending on how far the bird is, you're like, I can't tell how big that is. I can't tell if it's bigger or smaller than a crow. And so um, I always look at the tail when they're like up above my head, flying around and circling. Um, so ravens have that diamond shaped tail, rhombus shaped tail, where a crow's is a little more square and rectangular. So that's another really good clue, especially when they're in flight. And then also crows, I always look like, is there more than one of them, more than two of them? Because that will give me a clue too. And if like size is, isn't obvious or I'm not able to see that fur on the bill because they're just too far away. <clears throat> and I just had to put in this joke because, you know, there's only two of them. It's an attempt, but not, not quite there. <laughs> Nature puns are my favorite. All right, so drum roll for our next couple of birds, um, the hairy woodpecker and the downy woodpecker. So woodpeckers are incredible birds. Uh, the more I learn about them, the more their adaptations absolutely astound me. Um, so these are two of the more common woodpeckers in the area. And in fact, in most montane forests, you can find these birds and several other ecosystems. Basically what they need is trees and bugs. So woodpeckers are pretty well adapted to a lot of North American forests. Um, you're probably going to find the um, downy woodpecker a little more often than the hairy woodpecker. Um, and just like this graphic shows us, it's a little smaller and their plumage is slightly different, but I will say the plumage is, as you can tell, very similar. The males will always have a red spot on the back of their head near their knee. Um, and then their eye ring can be a little different. I'll show you on another picture, it's a little e easier. But basically um, the feathers on the outer tail so kind of that undertail, not on the wings, but on that feathers underneath. So it's sometimes easier when they're in flight, but they have spots on those outer tail feathers. And then the downy woodpecker has a little shorter beak and it's a smaller bird. And I've got a few questions, I think. We have a question from Brahma that is, are pileated woodpeckers found in Colorado? Ooh, good question. So I know um, pileated woodpeckers are not found in our region and I don't believe they're found in Colorado. I have to double check for you. I should have said this during my introduction. Um, I would claim myself to be an intermediate birder. I'm not advanced. I love hanging out with advanced birders. So, um, but I also am only about a year into my birding um, adventure in Colorado. Before joining the wild bear team, I was a naturalist in the Sierra Nevada, which um, a lot of the similar species and things translate. And we had pileated woodpeckers there, but I know we don't have them here, but in the whole state of Colorado, I'd have to get back to you, but I know not in our region. Great question. But that is the largest um, woodpecker in North America. They're pretty incredible. Um, so yeah, those are our two friends. So size and beak shape are kind of your first kind of points and then I'd start looking at the tail feathers and then there's even some other minute differences in like the hairies um, looking more like a comma versus a stripe and things like that in their um, pattern. Oh let me see there we go. So here's a live photo of two of them. So you can see the downy the white on the head is usually a little broader. You can see it's a little more round and short and then the hair is a little longer and skinnier, you could say. Um, all woodpeckers will kind of grab onto the bark and they have this extra kind of like, it's a back toe that hooks on and helps them move up and down on the bark. Um, and then you'll see that they kind of also, it's like a bike stand. They use their tail to hit down onto the tree like a bike stand would to help them balance as they're banging into the tree with their um, beaks. 
pretty incredible little adaptations there. Um, so that foot um, thing is actually called xiodactyl feet. So it has that back toe where most birds just have the front three going forward, but they have that extra one kind of helps them navigate up and down the bark. Pretty fancy. Okay, I can't talk about woodpeckers. Hold on, we have to listen to the Harry though first. I'm a little out of order, sorry friends. Here we go. That's just another word for a woodpecker pecking into a tree to get insects or to build its cavity, which is their nest. So they build, you know, usually depending on the bird, the pileateds will be a little bigger versus, you know, like the downy, but they make the little hole with their beak. And then they also drill into the tree and they do this often on snags. So dead standing trees or more dead wood because it's easier, but they'll do it on living trees as well. And they make a little kind of tunnel that goes down usually nine to 12 inches. And then they create this bigger bubble where they build their nest. And it's a really great strategy because it's warm. It's pretty safe from predators and it's where their food is. So they can jump right out home and find bugs on their home tree or be around tons of other coniferous trees and other trees in the forest. And then they build a new one each year. And it's really cool because nut hatches or even chickadees will roost and nest in the leftover, they're called secondary cavity nesters, and they're nest in the old holes that woodpeckers leave behind. Because a woodpecker doesn't want to use it year after year, nests can get gross, and also if the same woodpecker is using it, predators will eventually sniff that out. But if different birds build different nests or use different old nests, um, it's usually a little safer of a plan. So that drumming sound and a drum in general, so the beak is built very like where kind of like a traffic cone where all the impact will spread out and um, not be as intense once it hits the um, face of the bird but also nature is so cool because it designed the skull and the tongue of the woodpecker to be part of that plan too to protect its brain so it doesn't turn into scrambled eggs and the birds are constantly getting concussions our brains are definitely not designed this way. Uh, <laughs> so basically what you can see, I know this is a crazy photo. I'm gonna explain it to you as best I can. If you look at the lower image at the end of that tongue, it kind of looks like it has little spikes. So it's a barbed tongue that basically is usually much longer than the mouth or the beak of the bird. So it's gotta be stored somewhere. So it goes out and the little barbs will stick into an insect so the bird is more successful. It's like a spear. If it wasn't, it might just go in and out. So that's a really great adaptation for actually catching insects. And then you can see when it goes back into the skull, it actually splits at the back of the throat and wraps around the skull and works like a seatbelt. That way when the bird is drumming, the, it's more held in place and the, and the brain doesn't go swish, swash, swish, swash all around. Another thing that nature did was in the front of the woodpecker skull, don't really have an image of it here, there's an extra layer of cartilage. So the same stuff that our ears and our nose are made of, it's kind of like a little pillow. You can almost think of like the airbag of like hitting that instead of hitting the hard skull, lessens the impact and also doesn't allow as much space for the brain to go swish, swish, swish in between. So that's really incredible because it's really important because the woodpeckers drill into a tree or drum into a tree with the same force as a jet taking off into outer space. That's over four G's of force. So nature really had to figure out a way of like, if I want this to be a insect eater that bangs into wood, I got to figure out how to protect their brain. And so that's a really awesome design and strategy and characteristic of woodpeckers that I just couldn't not show you. All righty. <clears throat> So this is um, last but not least, one of the bigger challenges of common birds um, all across North America. And um, that is the telling the difference between a Cooper's hawk and a sharp shin hawk. So I will openly admit that I still get these two mistake, um, mistaken for one another quite often, especially um, within their first year of life because when they're juveniles, they can look almost identical. 
Um, but if you study this graphic here a little bit, it's going to really help us out. Um, for one thing is that the females and the males are going to be a little larger. And that's true in most hawks and even most um, raptors. So that's a little different with those guys. Um, but with sharp chin versus a Cooper's, <clears throat> You can see their eyes a little more centered, whereas the Coopers is a little closer to their beak. And then they also have kind of like more of a square pointed head, um, whereas the Sharpshin is just nice and rounded. The Coopers are also in general a little bit bigger, but if you have a male's Coopers and a female Sharpie, it can be a little confusing. So really try to see first step is like, is this an adult? or a juvenile that I'm looking at. And then you can kind of go, is it maybe a male or a female? And then go into looking at the head and then really at the tail, especially when they're in flight. Um, looking at the tail can really help, I would say, because the shape is a little different. So um, unlike its head, the tail of a sharp chin is more square. And then on the Coopers, it's kind of like they switch with their head and their tail. It's a little more rounded and not as pointed like their cap is. Um, and then the sharp shin, part of where it got us named is it's really thinner legs. So that's kind of part of it. Um, and then the, I would say in general, um, these are a lot of general statements, but um, the chest and the breast of the sharp shin is a little more rounder and stockier and like more broad. Um, and then the Coopers is just kind of longer and skinnier in general. Um, okay. This is of a goshawk, but it is also a member of the occipiter family. So occipiters are different than the budios, which are like red tail hawks and all those other more soaring hawks, whereas occipiters like our goshawks, sharp shins, and coopers are forest hawks. So they're actually hunting in the forest in between trees. And typically their prey is gonna be other birds like grabbing a chickadee or a dove or even a squirrel every once in a while, but off the trees or even in mid flight as a chickadee dipping from one tree to another. So it's pretty incredible. And scientists have actually found that they tend to have a lot of fractured bones and things even more than other birds because of all the accidents or mishaps they have when they're diving in between a branch or going in between the underbrush. Um, so this is an excerpt of a really cool video of a falconer or a hawk specialist working with a goshawk named Ellie through an um, obstacle course, kind of showing you just how awesome they are. So occipiters will also have a longer, skinnier tail than the is like the red tail, because they need it for balance and for really fine tuning and navigating those forests where a red tail needs a broad tail to soar and then just dive. So let's watch it. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Now I'm going to rotate the slit to simulate the small gaps between trees. Ellie seems able to mold her body to any shape. Next, I want to simulate a tunnel through the undergrowth. So incredible. Amazing. Ellie turns the situation to her advantage, using her legs to launch herself at her prey. I encourage you guys to YouTube that because it has a full like three minute video with all different shapes, all different obstacle courses, and you learn a little bit more about how that works um, aerodynamically and their adaptations. It's really quite so cool. Um, oops, wrong button. There we go. Mm -hmm. All right, so we are almost out of time, but I just want to show you this other real live photo of the differences. So another thing that I hadn't really mentioned before is the eye. So Coopers will have a redder, darker, well, not darker, but more red pronounced eye. And then a sharp shins is more orange. Once again, that changes between juvenile and adult. We have a question about the hawk video. What is the name of it again? Um, I'm trying to remember. Let's or can look. you drop the name in the chat? Yes, I can drop the name in the chat. Um, 
we can even, it's goshawk flies. Yeah, I can try to copy this. There we go. Um, I'll do that in just one second. Here we go. Okay. Um, there we go. Great question. I want as many people to see that as possible. Okay, here we go. So this is some additional resources that a lot of what I used um, to get my knowledge in general and for this presentation. So I mentioned all about birds. That's a great beginning landing pad for either before or after. Say so you're out bird and you're like, I think this is a sharp shin, but I can't tell. Take as many notes as you can in your journal and in your field guide and then go back and look at that online. And that can really maybe help you narrow it down or studying it before and going, like, I'm going to this habitat. I know I'm probably gonna see warblers and dippers. And so studying it beforehand can really help you out, um, especially with tearing differences between male, female or juvenile adults. That can be real helpful. It has the sounds, it has printables, all sorts of stuff. Audubon in general, whether it's Boulder Audubon Society, who's one of our partners for the big year, or their website or their apps on their phone, all great resources. eBird, which is what we're using for our um, big year. So if you haven't registered for our big year yet, please do so on our website, join our Facebook group. And on eBird, it contributes to the citizen science. So we're just, it's a friendly competition to get as many people out there counting bird species in the area, entering it in, turning it into wild bear, and then that helps ornithologists all around the country understand migratory patterns, species distribution, as well as when you enter it into wild bear, you qualify for really fun monthly prizes like um, we've got some field guides, we've got bird chimes, we've gotten donations from bird or boulder birding company and so many other partners that are helping us out making this really fun. Um, but it also helps the science. So, but if eBird's not for you, just join us anyway. We're doing monthly bird walks and talks like this one. Um, and soon in May, we'll start joining safely in person to go outside looking for birds together. Um, and that's, a, that's how I've learned most of my knowledge is just going out with birders that are better than me that know more than me about the area or just in general. And I just absorb as much as I can and practice what they practice and I'm patient, you know, um, getting a good field guide um, and then just practice, practice, practice. Like with any skill, it just takes time and practice and getting outside and actually doing it and asking the good questions about what you're seeing um, and then following it up with some research, whether that's asking somebody or digging into these resources that I just mentioned. Um, and then without any further ado, I just want to say thank you so much. I've got, a, we have so much going on at Wild Bear right now. It's a really exciting time. So I wanted to list, um, I know it's a lot to digest. There's a little bit for everyone from kids to adults and everybody in between going on um, the next couple months and especially during the summer. So just take a few minutes to look over this, but I mostly just want to say thank you all so much for joining me on Monday during your lunch hour. Um, I hope you learned a little bit. I hope you had some fun and I hope to see you at future webinars or future wild bear events, whether it's for our big year to learn more about birds or other walks and talks and different things or sending our, your kid to our summer camps. Um, birds are such a great gateway to nature. So it's, yes, this can be a competition. Yes, it can contribute to science, but it's also just a great way to go outside. And the more I learn about birds, the more I'm learning about everything else around me because I'm learning about what they're eating. And so I learned about those bugs and those plants. I'm learning about the trees that they nest in. I'm learning about the waterways. And you start to see the interconnection of it all. And birds are just like a doorway into the whole interconnectedness of it all. And other questions? Yes, yeah, so the hawk video, they would like the link. And then Steve asks, if there's time, can you go back to the hawk graphic? Yes. Um, I have a few minutes. We can go back to the hawk graphic while I try to find the hawk video. So I know I can only share. Is this the one or the one with the, probably this one with the notes is I'm guessing. 
and then Aaron, can I maybe borrow your computer to find the link? And if anyone has any other questions or okay. comments, you can go ahead and leave it in the chat box. I'm going to help um, with those last minute questions, sharing that. If you're ready to go, that's okay. Um, my email is michelle at wildbear.org. So if you have any feedback, questions, want to sign up for things our website's a great way to do that but you're always more than welcome i invite it for you to email me let me know what you think let me know your other questions and we'll go from there and i hope to see you guys out birding our first um official bird walk is on migratory bird day of may 8th so that's going to be a really fun group and we're going to be doing those monthly bird walks the second saturday of every month and then each month there will also be a virtual as in-person options for everyone interested in the big year. And like I said, we have events for pretty much everybody else. Um, so I had additional question about swallows um, and if they gather in large groups. Yes, they typically do. Um, in fact, we call them colonies, much like you would call a bat colony or a bee colony. So that's why often you don't see just the one mud cup nest you see at least a couple, if not hundreds, depending on where they're building and what the resources are and how big that colony is. But yeah, they're very social birds and they often interact with other swallows and other insect eaters. They kind of, you can find big swarms um, by the willows or by the water shore of all sorts of different swallows dipping and diving um, for all the little insects that are flying by. Awesome. Well, thank you all who are still involved in the chat um and we hope to see you again and thank you to my co-workers for helping me out with the chat and everything today as well all right take care everyone and happy birding